Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Now that we have laid a bunch of groundwork to understand what the metabolic therapeutic targets are while using metabolic therapy for the management of cancer, now we can go into detail about specific targets and using specific agents in order to hit those targets. Today, we're going to be discussing a few inhibitors of an important enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, PDK. Some of these things we have talked about and discussed in the past, and some of them we have not. So stay tuned. Let's get into it. So I want to start out by highlighting what in particular PDK is, how it interacts to maintain the Warburg effect or aerobic glycolysis, and how by inhibiting this enzyme, which is pathologically acting in cancer, will help us on our journey to beating cancer. So this article is published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, and it's titled Therapeutic Targeting of the Pyruvate Dehydrogenase Complex slash Pyruvate Dehydrogenase Kinase PDC-PDK Axis in Cancer. And what it says here is, consequently, the PDC-PDK axis has long been a therapeutic target. The most common underlying mechanism accounting for PDC inhibition in these conditions is a post-transcriptional upregulation of one or more PDK isoforms, leading to the phosphorylation of the E1A subunit of PDC, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Such perturbations of the PDC-PDK axis induce a glycolytic shift, whereby affected cells favor ATP production by glycolysis over mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation and cellular proliferation over cellular quiescence. Dichloracetate, DCA, is the prototypic xenobiotic inhibitor of PDK. Therefore, maintaining PDC in its unphosphorylated catalytic active form. So what exactly is this saying? We have pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and it is very important to get pyruvate from the end of glycolysis, like it's normally created, and converting pyruvate into the next step of the TCA cycle, which allows normal mitochondrial biology and energetics to prevail. When we have increases of this PDK enzyme, and there are several, there are isoenzymes, there are one through four, that will put a blockade on PDC. So therefore now pyruvate cannot get converted into the next step in the mitochondria so that mitochondrial biology and energetics can actually function. So what happens is, is that essentially this PDK enzyme by blocking PDC will force the cell to undergo Warburg metabolism, which creates a vicious cycle. And the reason why it creates a vicious cycle is because hypoxia inducible factors will actually upregulate and activate PDK and lactate, which is the end product of fermentation, both aerobic and anaerobic fermentation, but in this case, we're talking about aerobic fermentation, the Warburg effect. When you have excess lactate, that's going to feed back on HIF. HIF is going to feed back on PDK, and it's going to create this vicious cycle. And that vicious cycle is going to lead to angiogenesis, immune suppression, and metastatic disease, as well as propagation of the Warburg metabolism. So you can see how this is a major node within the pathologic cancer biology and metabolism. And what it further says in this paper is it says that DCA is rapidly absorbed, widely distributed in vivo, and readily crosses the blood-brain barrier, which accounts for the rapid, within minutes, stimulation of PDC activity following its oral or parenteral administration. Repeated dosing leads to a more sustained increase in PDC activity that has been attributed to decreased enzyme turnover therefore providing a second mechanism for PDC simulation. So we know this is effective. We know it affects the enzyme that is directly responsible for creating at least part of this vicious cycle that propagates Warburg metabolism, uncontrolled cancer growth, and all the other things that we know about that Warburg metabolism is responsible for. We know it is the poster child for PDK inhibition. But what does it later say in the paper? DCA is not patentable, so its development has been hampered by a lack of pharmaceutical support. So that's really the issue here, is that a lot of these medications, nutraceuticals, et cetera, are not patentable, 
So therefore, they know they can't make a huge amount of profit. So therefore, even though these things are effective, even though these things make biologic sense, they are shelved for trying to make the next hot, patentable medication and or pharmaceutical. Sad. So this paper is titled DCA, dichloroacetate and cancer, an overview towards clinical applications. What it says here is there is an extensive body of literature describing anti-cancer properties of DCA, but its effective clinical administration in cancer therapy is still limited to clinical trials. The spread of reports supporting the efficiency of DCA in cancer therapy has prompted additional studies that led to find other potential molecular targets of DCA. Interestingly, DCA could significantly affect cancer stem cell fraction and contribute to cancer eradication. Collectively, these findings provide a strong rationale towards novel clinical translational studies of DCA in cancer therapy. But as we saw in the prior paper, that is likely not going to happen anytime soon because it is not a patentable drug, unfortunately. So let's go and look at some of the diagrams that are supporting this mechanism. So we have glucose that is going through glycolysis, getting converted to pyruvate. What should happen is that pyruvate should go through this PDH enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. And that enzyme or enzyme complex, it's also known as PDC, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And this pyruvate should get converted to acetyl-CoA and it should be used in the TCA cycle and subsequently used to power oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. However, because of aberrant physiology and the use of PDK, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, that is going to put a block on PDH. So therefore that pyruvate has to get shuttled into lactate. And then we create the acidic tumor microenvironment and all the things that's wrong with that. So what DCA essentially is doing is it's blocking PDK and it's going to allow this blockade of PDC or PDH to be uninhibited. So now we can restore normal physiology and have pyruvate go and participate in the normal bioenergetics of the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. And that leads to cancer cell death, ultimately. And this would be considered metabolic reprogramming. The next thing they talk about in this paper is that this is not limited to the rapidly dividing cells. It's also going to hit and hammer these more quiescent cancer stem cells, which we know are the bane of the existence of conventional medicine because conventional medicine in general is attacking rapidly dividing cells only. And this is what leads to chemotherapy failure and drug resistance. So DCA through the same exact mechanism is going to do exactly what it did in a normal cell. And it's going to do the exact same thing at metabolic reprogramming and killing the cancer stem cell. This paper is titled Pyruvate Dehydrogenase Kinase as a Novel Therapeutic Target in Oncology. And what it says here is that inhibition of PDK with either small interfering RNAs or the orphan drug DCA, dichloroacetate, shifts the metabolism of cancer cells from glycolysis to GO or glucose oxidation and reverses the suppression of mitochondrial dependent apoptosis. So what it essentially does is it removes the break from these cancer cells killing themselves through program cell death. In addition, this therapeutic strategy increases the production of diffusible Krebs cycle or TCA cycle intermediates and mitochondrial derived reactive oxygen species, activating P53 or inhibiting pro-proliferative and pro-angiogenic transcription factors like nuclear factor of activated T cells and hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. These effects result in decreased tumor growth and angiogenesis, in a variety of cancers with high selectivity. In a small but mechanistic clinical trial in patients with glioblastoma, a highly aggressive and vascular form of brain cancer, DCA decreased tumor angiogenesis and tumor growth, suggesting that metabolic targeting therapies can be translated directly to patients. Let's see if we can't take a look at this graph as well. So we have DCA, it's putting the brakes on PDK, it's going to uninhibit PDH. Pyruvate is now able to get into the mitochondria and be converted into acetyl-CoA like it's supposed to, participate in the Krebs cycle, participate in the electron transport chain, which then decreases multiple mechanisms, including HIF-1-alpha and increasing P53 that ultimately leads to decreased proliferation, decreased angiogenesis, and increases in apoptosis of cancer cells. Astounding. If only someone had the interest to actually get this drug to market so people could actually use this, it would be amazing. So from the same paper, conclusion, in summary, a diverse number of signaling pathways and oncogenes result in resistance to apoptosis and a glycolytic phenotype, aka the Warburg effect aerobic glycolysis. DCA, dichloracetate, can reverse this metabolic remodeling 
and may be an effective anti-cancer agent in a number of tumors. The preclinical and recent clinical evidence that DCA as a single agent might be effective in GBM, glioblastoma multiforme, suggests its use in other glycolytic forms of cancer. Moreover, the greatest effect may be synergistic with existing chemotherapy as DCA unlocks cancer cells from a state of apoptosis resistance. Preliminary evidence in which the highest induction of apoptosis was achieved with the combination of DCA and temozolomide supports this idea. Therefore, in future clinical trials, DCA could be given simultaneously with standard therapy in an attempt to increase its effectiveness and potentially decrease the required dose, limiting the toxicity of standard therapies, which are often, often are non-selective to non-cancerous tissues, aka they kill the good tissues along with the bad. The ability to target the unique metabolic profile of cancer cells suggests that imaging and diagnostic studies such as PET imaging may track the metabolic modulation of therapies like DCA. Finally, preclinical biopsies from patients can acutely be treated with DCA and mitochondrial function can be quickly assessed, potentially predicting the clinical response to DCA, which could be used to facilitate patient selection. So what they're talking about is essentially using PET scanning, obviously the use of radio-labeled glucose uptake by cancer cells to look at how in real time DCA is metabolically reprogramming these cancer cells and taking biopsies to essentially look for markers that would suggest that DCA may be an effective treatment. That's pretty risky given that we're talking about GBM, which is a brain tumor. So we're talking about opening up the skull, taking a biopsy to see if this is effective or not, when we know for the most part that almost all cancer, at least according to research, utilizes Warburg metabolism and glycolytic phenotypes. So therefore, it seems like it would be safer just to give it a trial, but I'll digress. This paper is titled Targeting Glucose Metabolism of Cancer Cells with Dichloroacetate to Radiosensitize High-Grade Gliomas. And what it says here is that DCA reverses the Warburg effect by inhibiting pyruvate dehydrogenase kinases, which subsequently activates mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation at the expense of glycolysis. This effect is thought to block the growth advantages of HGG's high-grade gliomas and improve the radiosensitivity, aka these cells' sensitivity to radiation therapies of HGG cells. The review highlights the main features of altered glucose metabolism in HGG cells as a contributor to radio resistance and describes the mechanism of action of DCA. So we have talked about these mechanisms at length in prior videos, but essentially we have hypoxia or pseudohypoxia, which has direct effects on HIF-1-alpha, and HIF-1-alpha is then going to basically upregulate glycolysis, glutamine, etc., as well as it's going to turn on this PDK enzyme. And dichloroacetate right here is going to put the brakes on PDK and it's going to allow pyruvate, instead of getting caught in this vicious cycle of pyruvate to lactate through lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, it's going to allow for normal physiology for pyruvate to get converted by PDH to acetyl-CoA and participate in the TCA cycle, which is going to lead to either a metabolic reprogramming or the restoration of the ability for these cells to undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. Astounding. It also is going to sensitize these same cancer cells, which were radio resistant or basically were resistant to radiation therapies. It's going to leave them now sensitive and the radiation through excess oxidative stress is going to damage these cancer cells and lead to their demise. And this is exactly how HBOT and high dose IB vitamin C work. They increase reactive oxygen species in cancer cells in particular and lead to oxidative stress and cell death. And when you are combining therapies such as DCA, such as a ketogenic diet, such as intermittent fasting, you're going to lower the shields even further of the cancer cell, leaving them even more susceptible to oxidative therapies and higher success. So I want to take a step back and talk about other things that we know about that can inhibit PDK or pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. And one of those things believe it or not, is the simple B vitamin thymine, B1. So in this study, it says high dose B1 reduces proliferation in cancer cell lines analogous to DCA or dichloroacetate. And it says here that both thymine and DCA reduce the extent of PDH or PDC phosphorylation, reduced glucose consumption, lactate production, and mitochondrial membrane potential. High dose thymine and 
DCA did not increase ROS, but increased caspase 3 activity. Caspases are related to the programmed cell death or apoptosis. Our findings suggest that high-dose thymine reduces cancer cell proliferation by a mechanism similar to that described for dichloroacetate. And in this paper, it says the effects of thymine on breast cancer cells. The mechanism of this relationship was identified through the measurement of enzymatic activity and metabolic changes. Results, a high dose of thymine reduced cell proliferation in these breast cancer cells, 63%, but didn't affect apoptosis and the cell cycle profile. Thymine had a number of effects in these breast cancer cells, reduced extracellular lactate levels and growth media. It's shutting down the Warburg effect. Increased cellular pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. It's turning back on regular metabolism activities and the baseline and maximum cellular oxygen consumption rates it's also having decreased non-glycolytic acidification, glycolysis, and glycolytic capacity. Something as simple as high-dose IV thymine or high-dose thymine, a very powerful inhibitor of this PDK enzyme, helps reverse Warburg metabolism and can decrease proliferation of some cancer cells by up to 63% by itself. That's not even in combination with other metabolic therapies. This is astounding and exceedingly safe. So I'm going to just highlight a couple other things that we have talked about in the past, but you may not have caught because I was talking about many different pathways and I had not really laid out the importance of PDK at that point. So one of the other things that melatonin does is it actually acts on PDKs very similar to dichloroacetate. So again, thymine, melatonin, these are things that are easy to obtain, are safe and have multiple targets, but melatonin affects PDKs just like dichloroacetate, just like thymine pretty cool. And I'm going to end on this slide. So this is another inhibitor of PDK. So if you see here, 125 hydroxy vitamin D3 also puts the break on PDK and subsequently uninhibits PDH. So it participates in this metabolic reprogramming and just chalk it up for another amazing thing that vitamin D and its analogs can do. I hope that you're starting to see how these metabolic therapies work, why they are so important and how powerful they can be when utilized in combination. A lot of these studies are done in a vacuum where they take one substance, DCA, thymine, vitamin D, melatonin, among others, and they look at their activity and they show how profound they are by themselves. But what ultimately should be done thoughtfully by the help of your doctor or healthcare practitioner is they should be using a combination approach to inhibit these important nodes that are driving the aberrant metabolism in cancer, the dreaded Warburg effect. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. There is a lot left to cover. Until next time.